1 Kings 19, it's still small voice. If you have your Bibles open, let's read verse 11. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we do pray that you would help us, Lord, to grow in our sensitivity to hearing your voice and developing, Lord, a a hearing voice to hear when you speak to us, Lord. And so we ask that you would give us ears to hear today what you would share with us now in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, God spoke to Elijah in a still small voice. And I think many of you know this text and And, uh, you know, when you think about how does it apply to us, well, there are a lot of voices in our lives telling us what to do. I mean, every stage when you are young, you know, in school or when you're in college or when you're a young adult and just voices saying, do this, do that, whatever. And I think for every Christian to think about how do I know is that voice that I hear do that? Is it God or is it my conscience or is it my flesh or is it the voice of the world? Right. And and. The question, how can you recognize that still small voice of God? And today we're going to look at three things that make it conducive for you to hear that still small voice from God, right? And that's important. And so number one, if you're taking notes, is to develop a a discerning spirit to know if it's the still small voice of God. Number one, you have to be born again, right? So uh, Nicodemus asked Jesus, and Jesus said in John 3, 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So why is being born again the first thing? Well, because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. In other words, when you're not born again, the Bible and God's Word seem foolish. I remember being at a friend's house before I was a Christian, when I was an atheist, And there was a Bible there, and I'd never seen one before. His family was a Christian family. And I opened it and read a paragraph and thought, what is this? I I asked him, what is this? He said, it's a Bible. I said, where'd it come from? He's like, I don't know. I could not comprehend what it was saying. And that's because the Bible says, when you're not spiritually alive. So it's important that a person is spiritually alive in order to hear and discern the voice of God. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So the first step in discerning God's voice is to be born again, right? And, and how do you do that? Well, you simply recognize that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that all of us are sinners, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all we have to do is confess with our mouth and ask the Lord to forgive us and come into our lives. In Romans 10, 10, it says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. So we speak with our mouths. We pray. We say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. I invite you into my life. Fill me with your spirit. So that's step one. Step two uh, in developing a discerning spirit to know if that still small voice is from God is to know God's word. And I think this is critically important, and I think it's probably one of the major problems with the church in America today is that people don't know God's word. Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing in between the division of the soul and the spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God's word is alive and it can discern whether those thoughts are from the flesh or from the spirit. And when you are taking in the word of God, it, it is like uh, the, Jesus said it's like a living seed. The word of God is like a living seed. And when it's planted in fertile soil in your heart, it can bring spiritual life, fulfilling life, a rewarding life. Uh, Jesus, or in 1 Peter 1, 23, Peter said, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God. And remember when Jesus told the parable of the sower planting seed in different soils, and he's speaking about a person's heart. And so Knowing the word of God is critically important when you are discerning, is that God speaking to me, right? If, uh, if I pray and say, well, Lord, is it your will that I, you know, go to the bar and drink vodka and see how, uh, how good a drinker I am, right? And some of you would say, well, how will you know if God says to you? Well, you know that the Bible says drunkenness is a sin, right? So, so you shouldn't do that. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So uh, God will not tell you something that contradicts his word. And I think that's the 
fundamental thing about hearing God's voice and discerning God's voice is that God will not contradict his word. In Hebrews 13, 8, it says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God does not change his mind about what is right and what is wrong. What about what is sin and what is not sin? What was sin 2,000 years ago is a sin today. Now, people change their mind all the time. People are flaky, but God's word is the same. Now, that is amazing to me, that God's word has been the same. And when I think about it, we're reading, a, we're reading a section of scripture that's thousands and thousands of years old, and I look at it and say, yep, those truths are exactly important for today, right? And, and I don't want to go off on how much science has changed. <laughs> you know, they used to bleed you and put leeches on you when you were sick and <laughs> drain blood out of you, and, and uh, yeah, we wouldn't want to go on all. Science changes daily, right? Whatever science said 2,000 years ago now is, is idiotic, right? And even what science said 100 years ago is idiotic. I mean, when I was in school, the speed of light didn't change. Now they're like, oh, we know the speed of light changes, right? When I was in school, your brain cells didn't grow back. So I thought, oh, no, I'm in trouble, right? But now we know they grow back, right? Uh, anyway, but we know that God's word doesn't change. And so God isn't going to change it for me or for you, right? And, and 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. So God's word is so valuable for your spiritual growth. And that word complete in verse 17, it means mature. And so God's word corrects us, it reproves us, it instructs us in righteousness, and it helps us to grow and mature spiritually. And so when you think about when you're praying about something and you want to be in tune with God's spirit and what is God saying, you need to know that God's word, it will direct us in many things. God never contradicts his word. And so when someone comes to me and says, I've been praying about this, and I say, what do you think God's telling you? And then they tell me something, I immediately run it through the word of God. And if they tell me something that's contradictive to the Bible, then I say, well, you know, the Bible says opposite of what you think God's telling you. Or if they're saying something that's you know, in line with God's word, I'm like, well, that's, that's what the Bible says, right? I mean, if somebody says to me, Pastor Bob, I'm praying about buying this house or doing this thing, and, and, uh, and I've been praying, and I feel like the Lord said, well, you can afford it, so you should do it. I'm like, well, that goes with it. The Bible says that, you know, you shouldn't make foolish financial decisions, so it goes together. Now, uh, how do you get to know God's word? Well, that's pretty simple, right? You just read the Bible, and, you know, and if you're a spiritual baby, you know, like when you're a little baby, I have a little grandson who is three months old and he can't feed himself. So we have to feed him. So if you're a spiritual baby and you became a Christian last week, well, then you can come to church and I'll read the Bible to you. If you are new at our church and you think, Pastor Bob, what's with all the Bible verses? We come here and it's just like one after another after another. You talk really fast and cram in a whole bunch of Bible verses. What's with all of that? <laughs> well, here's the thing. God speaks to us through his word, not the pastor's stories. I remember hearing the pastor you know, reading the Bible, and back then we all had paper Bibles, and I had a paper Bible, and we're reading it, and I just felt like God was speaking to me through the Word, and I would have a question about something, and I'd come to church, and God would speak to me, and, and so that was one of the main reasons I came back. I didn't believe in God, and I'm like, but he's talking to me. I don't believe in him, but he's talking to me. <laughs> it's like, and so, all right, but we might say, well, Pastor Bob, is that the only way that God speaks to people? No, and, 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 you know, in Elijah's situation, there was wind and fire and earthquake, and God wasn't in any of those things. He was in a still small voice. Sometimes God is in the wind. Remember in Acts 2, 1, on the day of Pentecost, we had fully come. They were uh, all in one accord in the place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind. So sometimes he does that. Sometimes it's in the fire. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They're in Daniel 3, 24. King Neb Nebuchadnezzar said, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? Look, he answered. I saw four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Sometimes it is in the earthquake, right? Sometimes he shakes your world. In Acts 16, remember when Paul and Silas were in jail, and they were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, and suddenly a great earthquake. And so the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened. So God does speak in different ways, right? And, and in my life, he spoke in different ways. And it isn't always in that still, small voice. And so the third step in discerning God's voice uh, is to develop a quiet time. And I think this is probably one of the most important things for every Christian to develop. And I do think it probably is one of the areas that many Christians are weak. And, and that is that to develop a time where you deliberately spend time alone and to try to hear from God. I think one of the worst things that can happen to a church is when the believers in the church begin to believe that time alone in silence in the morning or at night is not necessary in hearing God's voice. And here's the thing. I have had 
Christians tell me, I don't need to do that. I've had pastors tell me, oh yeah, haven't you ever read the book from Brother Lawrence, Practicing His Presence? I'm like, yeah, I've read it. Yeah, and I do want to hear God all day, but it is a lot easier for me to cultivate hearing God's voice when I have a, a, a system in place, a habit of spending time alone with him, right? And I need to cultivate these disciplines of hearing God's voice. And you know why? And you need to do it too. Because most of us, our whole life, we've been cultivating not listening, right? You know that? When you're two years old, right? I was just in the nursery. There's a bunch of little one and two-year-olds in there. And they cultivate not listening. My little granddaughter, you know, I'm going to leave. So she starts crying. I'm like, what are you crying about? I'll be back. She just tunes me out, right? <laughs> now, why is that? It's a sinful nature, right? And you tell them something. Hey, don't do that. And they look at you and they go, no. And what are they saying? I'm not hearing what you're saying. I'm doing what I want, right? And that continues on as a teenager. So we need to develop and cultivate listening to God's voice because we, and, and you know, you can do it with God as well. And, and for me, many times, even though I try to hear God's voice, sometimes God speaks to me and I don't want to hear it. And I pretend like he's my mom or dad and I just tune it out, right? And so many people realize things need to change in their life, but, but they don't change, right? And and when you are willing to cultivate the ability to discern God's voice, then God will speak to you about every issue in your life, whatever it is. If you're having problems in your marriage and you are hearing God's voice, he's going to speak to you about how to fix it. As a young Christian, my wife and I used to have disagreements, and she would say to me, did you pray and have a quiet time today? And it would just make me angry. I'm like, what does that have to do with anything? He's like, well, you're acting like you're in the flesh. You're very carnal. And uh, if you would pray and start your day with Jesus, then it wouldn't be like that. And I remember just like, I don't get angry very much, but I think this is making me angry. right? And so, you know, it helps, right? And God would speak to me. And so I started praying and, and uh, you know, financial choices, right? When you pray, Lord, should I buy this car? Should I buy this house? Should I buy this motorcycle, whatever it is, and you pray God wants to speak to you about financial choices and, and about fear. You know, God wants to speak to you when you're fearful, and we've talked about that a lot. Jesus said, don't worry, and if you know God's word and you start worrying, and my wife used to worry, and I would say, hey, you know, Jesus said, don't worry. What's it going to add to your life? One little bit. And so God's word, and, and when you speak to him, he, and, and when you cultivate that hearing, he'll speak to you about how to love people. You might come to church and say, well, how do I love my neighbor? How do I invite someone to church on Easter? How do I share the gospel with someone? And as you pray, God will speak to you, right? And, and he'll say, hey, well, invite him over for dinner and then invite him or, or take one of the tracks and give him a track or give him that invite card and say, hey, you should come to this thing or whatever. But your life is infinitely different when you are living every day being directed by God. And, and many people are stuck looking for God to speak to them through you know, the wind or the fire or an earthquake. But what if most often God speaks to people through a still small voice like he did with Elijah, right? I mean, it just in that still small voice. And here's the thing. When you study the life of Jesus, he regularly spent time in solitude. Now, if you say you're a Christian and, you know, a Christian, what is that? It's Christ-like, right? A little Christ. And so if you want to be like Jesus, it's more than just loving people and forgiving people. And that's important, but also is to develop the spiritual disciplines that he'd had. In Luke 4, 42, it says, now when it was day, he departed and went into a deserted place. So this was a regular thing in Jesus' life. In Matthew 14, 23, uh, when he sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself and prayed. Now, this is hard for Americans. It's not really part of our culture, right? But Jesus modeled for us going to a place where we could be alone in silence. And and it is so good for your spiritual growth. And, and if you want to go to the next level in your spiritual life, <clears throat> you can think about doing some of these things and making them a practice in your life. Uh, you know, I think most of the men and women that I know that have had the most rapid, consistent spiritual growth in their life and have the greatest impact on the people around them have developed this quiet time, having time alone. And a quiet time where they spend time reading the Bible, praying, worshiping, listening for God's voice, writing it down, having a notebook or, you know, a place to write things down. And in my own life, everything in my life that has been good comes from this. Everything flows from my time alone with the Lord. I mean, from before I was in ministry, when I was single, about praying, about should I do this, should I do that, about uh, who I should marry. I remember, you know, I, went, I was teaching this Bible study, and my wife lived in Massachusetts, and she came home to visit her family, and she comes to this Bible study, and she tells the girl whose house it was that I was doing this Bible study, said, you know what? God told me I'm going to marry Bob. And uh, the girl told her, well, he doesn't date. And my wife said to her friend, Didi, well, he's going to start. <laughs> and so she told me, hey, God told me I'm going to marry you. And I'm like, woo. And so, uh, you know, 
I go home and pray. I'm like, God, you know, I come from a dysfunctional home. My dad's been married seven times. And I just prayed, Lord, I don't know how to have a good marriage. I don't even know how to pick a good wife. And so, Lord, who should I marry? And, and so I prayed. And for a long time, I, I'm not as spiritual as she is. I didn't do it in a day. It was like a year. But I prayed every day for a year. And then one day God spoke to me and said, she's the one. And now here we are 37 years later. And I'm like, what an awesome thing it is that you can consult God about your decisions, <laughs> right? And so when I think about having a great marriage for 37 years, it's not about how nice and polite and wonderful of a husband I am. It's about just obeying God, right? Just hearing his voice. And for me, you know, I didn't know what was going to turn out. None of you know what's in the future, but when God knows the future and he knows your life, and when you pray and hear his voice and listen to him, it is so good, right? I mean, just so many times, every good thing in my life has come from spending time praying and seeking God. In Mark 1, uh, 35, it says, now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, Jesus went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. So Jesus went to a place where he could be alone in silence to pray. And we see this principle operating in many people's lives in the Bible. Moses, Elijah, John the Baptist, the Apostle Paul, so many people. God spoke to them in times of silence. Now, I'm not saying that God can't speak in other ways, but most often in my life, it happens this way. And I think every Christian needs to find a place to be alone, to have solitude, because solitude works in our lives and things that we maybe don't even understand. You know, uh, when I spend time alone praying with the Lord and ask God to show me the truth about myself, God shows me my sin, and then I repent, and that gets things right with God. Now, what happens is, if people don't do that, sometimes people can think they're better than they are. Does anybody here know a prideful person who thinks they're perfect? <laughs> right? Well, what happens when you don't spend time in solitude asking God to show you the truth about yourself, you can become judgmental or a fault-finding person or hypocritical of other people uh, because you think in your mind that you're pretty perfect, right? But for me, when I spend time with the Lord in solitude, I'm more aware of my shortcomings, and then it helps me to be less critical and harsh with other people. It helps you to be more compassionate. In Psalm 46.10, he says, be still and know that I am God. So it's important that God helps us because we need his help to do it. It's very difficult. And to realize that you're designed to fellowship with God, right? And, and so you were created for fellowship with God. You're created to communicate with God, to get guidance and direction from him about your life. And when you do that, life is so much better. And, and we're designed to be renewed spiritually and physically. God told us, take a day off, right? He said, work six days, take a day off. You go out in the world and it's just so full of yuck. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, therefore we do not lose heart, even though the outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day, right? So day by day, God wants to renew you spiritually. And, and so how do you start having a quiet time? Well, I have four simple steps that I want to give you today that will help you if you're not doing it. Number one is find a place. Number two, have a system. Number three, make it a habit. And number four, don't give up because it's going to be hard. So number one, find a place. Well, where? Anywhere, right? It, does, it could be any place. It could be your basement, your attic, a closet, a storage shed. One pastor told me that he had a storage shed at his church, and he used to go in the storage shed and have quiet time. Now, one of the things I love about this building is that it's so big I can hide from the staff, and I can go pray and, and be alone. And, uh, but now we've been here quite a long time, and so they know where I hide. But... Uh, at home, I used to go out in our garage and sit in my car and pray or whatever. And so uh, find a place. And, and then number two, if you're taking notes, uh, find, uh, have a simple system, right? You need to schedule it when you're going to do it and how long you're going to do it. Like, and, and, and what to bring, bring a notebook or a phone or a pen and a Bible, right? And to be ready to write things down. And, and so for me, having a system involves like a Bible reading program through the Bible. And we've been doing that. Last night, a girl told me that I taught this sermon seven years ago. And when she heard it, she said she's been reading her Bible every day for the last seven years. It was like so exciting to hear. I was like, yes, somebody listen. Anyway, but... Uh, but so having a Bible reading program, I personally use the daily bread on my phone and I use the blue letter Bible on my phone. And then, uh, so I read, you know, the daily bread, which is a program reading through the Bible in a year. And then a time of silence, right? In my phone, I have a prayer list. And right after my prayer list, I have a, it says silence. And that's the cue to me. Okay, time to sit and listen to that still small voice. And I just sit there and I'm ready to write things down. And during, when COVID first started to happen, I did that. And I heard the Lord say, don't fear. And so I wrote that down. Don't fear. <laughs> and it's still in there. I didn't take it out, right? It's like so good. And then 
you know, I have a prayer list. And, and so um, having a prayer list of the people to pray for in your family, your church. So I pray for all of you. I pray for our church staff. I pray for our community and for my family. And so I can pray for all my family and all our church family and all of our staff in five or 10 minutes because it's all written down. You don't have to pray with your eyes closed. Right? I pray with my eyes open. And so uh, you know how, talk, how fast I'm talking right now? Well, I can pray faster with my mouth closed. Anyway, but uh, right? So I have a system, right? So I can get it done. Because if I don't have a system, here's what happens. I start wandering. My mind's like, ooh. You know, and if I'm in the green room and I'm in there praying and, you know, and, and a Ferrari drives by, whew, then I'm like, oh, Lord, can I have one of those? You know, <laughs> anyway. So I have a system, right? And, and every believer needs to spend time listening. That is an important dynamic. And, and it's the number one thing that people tell me they don't do. So the girl last night that told me she'd been reading her Bible for seven years, I said, do you sit in silence and listen to the Lord? And straight up, she said, nope, it's difficult. We have leadership retreats with our staff, and I give them time to go out and spend time in silence listening to the Lord. And when they come back, I said, how was it? And you know what some of them say? It's hard, right? And if you're like me, my brain is like, and then like silence, you know, it's like, it's hard. But it's, it's an important discipline that we can develop. And then part of the system number four is having a prayer list, right? And that is so important to have a prayer list in your system. And in my prayer list, when I'm reading through my Blue Letter Bible on my phone, if I come across a prayer that I'm like, that's an awesome prayer, I just highlight it, cut it, and paste it into my prayer list, and it's what I pray every day. And so uh, I have a few of them in here. First Chronicles 4.10, it says, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that you, your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, and that I may not cause pain. So, you know, when I first pasted that many, many years ago, I liked the part of, Lord, that you would bless me, right? And, and But now, when I pray that in my prayer, it's like, Lord, you have blessed me. I have a great family, a great church family. And so now I pray, Lord, keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. Now you might think, Pastor Bob, you pray, Lord, keep me from Yes, I realize the truth about myself. I could go off the rails at any minute, like all of you, right? I don't think, oh, Bob is so pure and holy. He doesn't need to read his Bible. He's, he's the pastor, <laughs> right? No. I, and I understand that I could say words that cause pain to people. I could do things that would hurt people, and I don't want to do that. And that's part of maturity, so I pray that. And then I have one, Psalm 139, 23, where David prayed, Search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me, and know my thoughts, and see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And I, I love praying that, Lord. And, and, and that's kind of a pause prayer, and like, okay, Lord, what do you want to say to me? And God will speak to you. And so find a place, have a system, make it a habit, right? Because we're creatures of habit, you know, so 21 days makes a habit. And then, you know, as you're developing a habit, uh, it will become part of your life. Now, here's the thing. This is not easy. If you're sitting there saying, I've heard this before, Pastor Bob, but here's the question. Jesus said the blessing comes from not hearing, but what? Doing, right? Are you doing it? And, and, and you probably are not going to do it. Some of you, why? Well, because Galatians 5.16 said this. It says, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the lust of the, fl the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Right? There's this battle inside, your flesh and your spirit. And your flesh does not want to read the Bible. And it does not want to sit in silence. And it doesn't want to fast and pray. Like we fast once a month and we pray. And, you know, when you start doing it and you make it a habit in your life, then you're like, flesh, you don't run my life. We're not eating today. And the flesh is like, uh, you know, and, and so it's a great thing. So if you want to go to the next level in your spiritual life, you can fast with us, pray with us, right? But 21 days makes a habit. So I would encourage you to ask your family to help you. My wife and I, when we first got married, I asked her to help me to start having a daily quiet time because I, I didn't have time. I had to get up at five. I had to be to work at six every day. <clears throat> and I worked seven days a week. And so she would help me. She would say, did you have quiet time? No. Oh, good. Go do it right now. I'm like, right now? Yes, right now. And, and so she would help me, right? And so uh, for some of you, you're more disciplined than others. She's super disciplined. And, and when you miss a day, don't give up, right? So if your counter is up at 400 and it goes to zero, don't turn it off. Like, you know, start the next day, right? Don't try to back up and catch up. If you're reading through the Bible, just keep going. You know, skip, you know, a day, no big deal. Just keep going, right? And it's important for us to realize that we are creatures of habit. And you have habits, you just don't realize it. When you get up in the morning, you do certain things. Some of you, you go to the coffee pot, make drip coffee if you're at that age, or, or if you're a different age, you get over there and get espresso and, and then pour a bunch of sugar in it and then like, you know, whatever, syrup and but whatever, but <clears throat> we have habits. <clears throat> and for me, one of my habits, as soon as I get up, is to read my Bible and before anything goes on and, and have this quiet time. And so here's the thing. When you make this a habit in your life, you will never regret it. 
I've never had one person come to me and say, Pastor Bob, you know, you've been teaching this for a long time. You've been here in college for 25 years. And, you know, I came to church the first day and, and you taught this and I've been doing it for 25 years. And, and you know what? I regret every day that I spend reading my Bible and praying. Never had a person say that, right? But you are, you're, you're never going to regret a minute of it, right? And sometimes we think, oh, but I gotta, I gotta read Facebook or Snapchat or Instagram or, or, uh, this is the Facebook group, right? And so, uh, it's the age. <laughs> Last night I said, how many of you have Snapchat? And like a 60-year-old lady said, me, anyway. But, uh, but here's the thing. It will be the greatest blessing in your life. If you're not doing it, and to start this habit. And so here's the four things. Find a place, have a system, make it a habit, and don't give up, right? And when you do that, it'll be one of the greatest blessings in your life. I meet people all the time that come up to me and say, Pastor Bob, I heard you talking about quiet time, and, and I started doing it a year ago, and it's changed my life. I mean, people tell me that all the time. And here's the thing. You know why I'm telling you? Because it changed my life, right? I was a jerk of a husband until I started having a daily devotion. And I would pray and say, Lord, you need to fix Susie. You know, she, has, she says this about me. She says, I'm blah, 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 blah. And the Holy Spirit, that still small voice, Bob, you, you are mean to her. You need to go tell her you're sorry. What? Lord, I'll do whatever you want. Next day, Lord, what do you want me to do? Same thing I told you yesterday. You didn't do it yet. What was that? I didn't write it down. Go tell your wife you're sorry. Next day, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. So now I write it down. And at least then I look at it and I'm like, okay. Because you know what? Step one is doing a quiet time. And that's not, the, that's not the hardest part. The hardest part is when God tells you things and then doing it, right? Because I don't want to do a lot of the stuff God says, right? Almost every big thing in my life, you know, I hear God's voice. He says, do this. I'm like, I don't want to do it, right? From the beginning, when our pastor said, you want to teach a Bible study? No. You want to play in the worship band? No. You want to serve? Yeah. What do you want to do? Well, what I want to do, right? I mean, it's like, uh, not what you want me to do. And so these three things that make it conducive for you to hear God's voice as we recap. Number one, be born again. So if you haven't done that, you need to do that today. Number two, know God's word. Good job coming to church and start reading your Bible. And number three, develop a quiet time. We talked about that. And here's the thing. You can start at any time to, you know, maybe you've done it before and you stopped, but you can start at any time saying, you know what? I want to develop hearing God's voice because it will be the greatest blessing to you. You know what? God spoke to me and said, come to Cobble. That's why this church is here. And, and I, I, I kind of like, oh, I'm not writing that down. <laughs> but then, you know, I keep praying, Lord, what do you want to say to me? And God says, do it, do it. And that's one of the things for me when God says it over and over and over again, and it helps me to, to discern. And when God is directing, he knows the future. He knows what are the best choices for your life. And when you get him involved and you hear his voice and you begin to follow his leading, man, life is so much more exciting. And it is just infinitely better because I don't know the future. And when I don't consult God and I just impulsively make decisions and do things, and sometimes there's a lot of regret that goes with that. You're like, oh, why did I do that? But here's the thing. You can start today. And if you've never accepted Jesus in your life, you can start today and say, Lord, I want to hear your voice. I want to be led by you. I want to experience your goodness, right? And, and as you do that, man, your life will be exciting. And so if you've never accepted Jesus, the Bible says in Revelation 3.20, and he was speaking to a bunch of people at church. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. And, and so if you're here today and you, you're not sure if you've invited Jesus in your life, you can do it today. You just simply pray. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart that that's how you receive salvation. And so we're going to pray this morning, and, and we're, I'm just going to lead us in a prayer. And if you'd like to invite Jesus in your life, you can just repeat after me and pray out loud. And, uh, and, and you saints, help us out. Let's pray together. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for this time. And, and uh, Lord, uh, we just pray that if there's anyone here today who needs to receive you, that they would pray this prayer. So repeat after me if you want to invite Jesus in your life. Dear Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner, and I need your forgiveness. I invite you into my life. Help me to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen.